Our presenter today is Jacquette Timmons. Jacquette is the founder of Sterling Investment Management. She is also an author and coach who helps people identify the underlying behaviors and beliefs that keep them from reaching their financial goals. Jacquette will be helping us learn to manage love and money in an easy and fun way. Thank you for your time today, Jacquette, and let's get started. Great, thank you so much, Maggie. Money may not buy love, but fighting about it will bankrupt your relationship. Michelle Singletary, who is a personal finance writer with the Washington Post, is the one who said this statement. And sadly, far too many couples have this as their reality. There are far too many couples, in my opinion, walking around in an emotional rut because they are in a financial rut. And it doesn't have to be this way. Yes, I know that talking about money can feel awkward at times and heck, even managing it on your own can present its challenges, let alone with someone else. But this whole notion that it has to be wrought with uh, difficulties that are inevitable is really not something that I subscribe to. And I want to help couples. I want to help those of you that are listening, find your groove when it comes to talking about money and find out what is your rhythm when it comes to figuring out how do you manage it? How do you integrate it with another person? And that is what today is all about. So many thanks to Lisa and Maggie and the rest of the staff at Savvy Ladies for hosting today's webinar and for inviting me to present my particular perspective on this topic. I thought what would be really cool in terms of getting us started is for me to ask you the same question that I did when I randomly approached total strangers on the street in my neighborhood in Brooklyn. And I simply asked the question, what comes to mind when you think of love and money? So if you are participating on the webinar and you have access to the chat, I'd love for you to enter your response to what comes to love and uh, what comes to mind when you think of love and money. And if you happen to be on the phone and you can multitask, send your answer to the email address that Maggie referenced. And I believe she said it was info at savvyladies.org. Share with us what comes to mind for you. And what I'm gonna do right now while you're doing that is share with you some of the responses that I got to these total strangers <laughs> on the street who were kind enough to answer my question, even if they thought I was a little strange for coming up to them. But here are a couple of the responses. One person said, I hate dealing with money and my husband loves it, so he handles everything. A guy to the question of what comes to mind when you think of love and money said money. A woman said, sex, I came across a husband and wife, and the husband said compromise, the wife said communication, and then I came across another woman who said the following, we don't talk about it, and we keep everything separate. I don't want to talk about it, because then I'd feel I'd have to do something. And as you might even, you know, sense from my tone of voice and simply sharing her response. I was particularly struck by her words. I was caught off guard in part because she evidenced a long standing thought that we have about money and that is that we are afraid of talking about it. Um, so that's one piece. And then the other piece is the correlation that she drew between talking and taking action. First of all, I don't think that we really have an issue talking about money as a culture. I think we talk about it all the time. I just don't think we're having the right conversations. The other thing is the presumption that if you take an action, that that action automatically has to be painful or burdensome. And obviously from where I sit, I disagree with this notion. I disagree with this line of thinking. And yes, I know, you know, that money can present its challenges when it comes to relationship. But I also think that it is one of the best communication tools that you and your beloved have 
at your disposal. So more on that later. But for now, let me hop on over to the chat box and see if any of you have shared. So one person says uh, stressful. <laughs> totally understand that. Anybody else have a comment to what comes to mind when you think of love and money? Well, the chat box is there, so, oh, not easy to discuss, yep. So if I, if I look at your answers and I compare them to the ones that I received awkward, yes, and I compare them to my random uh, <laughs> unscientific survey of people on the streets in Brooklyn, we see that there are some parallels in that number one, it's awkward, it's stressful. And I often joke and say that money is like that third leg, right? It shows up on the first day and it never ever goes away in terms of its presence and its impact. And when I work with couples or I work with people who are getting ready to be in a couple and they want the money part to go pretty smoothly, they're coming to me because they either want to know what to ask, what to do, and in some instances, it's a combination of both. And you might find that as you are participating in today's webinar, that you fall into one of those three camps. So let me tell you what you're gonna learn in our time together today. First, you're gonna learn how to have real conversations about money and how to initiate them with ease. And when I say real conversations, I'm suggesting that we move beyond only talking about money when there's a crisis, like you're mad at the other person because they spent $500 and you agree that you'd only spend 250. You're um, talking about, we need to replace the dishwasher or we need to save up for summer camp. Those are transactional conversations. Those are crisis oriented conversations. And when you only talk about money at those times, that's one of the reasons why it can feel very burdensome and painful. So we're gonna dive into how to have real conversations and what that actually means. The other thing that you're going to learn from our time together today is what does it take to manage the numbers and the emotions thereof? And how can you do that with greater ease? Um, what you may not know about me is that I have a really strong uh, tendency, if you will, that when it comes to talking about money, to not discount the numbers, because obviously they matter, but to not lead with them, to lead with what comes before the numbers. And we'll talk about that as we move further along. And then the third thing is, <clears throat> pardon me, what is the mindset and what are the habits that will help to make this fun? Because who wants to do something all the time if it feels like a chore and the thing that you just don't want to do? Um, so how can we make this whole love and money thing fun? Now, I'm meeting many of you, if maybe not all of you, for the very first time today. And Maggie gave you a little bit of background about me. Um, I am a financial behaviorist, and you can learn more about what I do and how at my website, jacquettetimmons.com. But what I want you to know is that I use every session, including this one, as an opportunity to expand your scope of inquiry about money beyond money. So during the brief time that we have together today, we're actually going to cover a lot of ground, delving into your beliefs and philosophy, behavior and habits, conditioning and creativity. And that may sound, oh my God, overwhelming, but we're gonna make this really concrete for you because every single one of you will leave here with at least one thing that you can do differently, whether it's an action to take or a shift in your mindset. And that one thing will be predicated on an actionable insight that you did not have when you entered this virtual space. And my reason for wanting to, one, make sure that we address the psychology and the emotions of money, but that we also pair that with something concrete is so that you will make smarter money and money-based decisions. And we're gonna do that by doing an exercise called the financial wheel. But before we get there, you'll see on your screen, if you're on the webcast, that I have a photo of mirrors. And I want you to indulge me for a moment and play along with me. If you have your purse nearby, 
where you have your cosmetic bag nearby and you can pull out your compact mirror. Or if you don't and you simply have something that you can look into and see your reflection, play along with me for a moment and just look at that and look into it. And notice what's going on. There is the act of you actually looking into whatever is serving as your reflective device. And then there is probably a thought cloud happening. And that thought cloud might go along the lines of, this feels really weird. Why is she asking me to do this? Or you might make a comment about your hair, about your makeup, about what you chose to wear today. It could be anything. And if you're wondering, what in the world does this have to do with money? Absolutely everything. Because instead of the mirror, your wallet becomes that reflective tool. And every single time you go into your wallet to pull out your cash, your debit card, your credit card, or you go online to do a banking or financial transaction, you are tapping into your underlying beliefs and behavior with money. You're tapping into what brings you joy, excitement, and enthusiasm. You're tapping into what brings you joy about your goals and your dreams. Also, what are you afraid of? What, what wakes you up in the middle of the night? What keeps you from going to sleep? What are your concerns? You are also tapping into and having reflected back to you your money strengths, your money style, and your money personality. And guess what? Every single time the person that you love goes into his or her wallet, the exact same thing is happening. So as I said earlier, when I talked about money being one of the best communication tools for you and your mate, this is why. When you invest the time to really explore these things, one, you get to know yourself better, you get to know your mate better and perhaps in a different light, and you also get to really examine and experiment with and have a better understanding about what is working in your relationship as well as what needs to be worked on. And before we go into the financial wheel exercise, let me just say that I recognize that number one, unless the couple is on the line, <laughs> that only one part of the couple is listening in. Um, but I also recognize that not all couples have the same challenge. For some, your numbers are rocking. You've got an awesome income statement. You've got an awesome balance sheet. But along the way of getting the numbers right, somehow the intimacy got fractured and you're not communicating as well as you once did. For others, you're quite comfortable being uncomfortable when it comes to communication, because what is that really, right? It is being vulnerable, it's being transparent. You don't have a problem going there, if you will, but your numbers are a hot mess. This exercise that we are about to do, the financial wheel, which is my go-to exercise with every coaching client and every workshop, whether it's 30 minutes, 60 minutes, or 90 minutes, will help you there. And it will help you to figure out what questions to ask, how to go about asking them. It will help you to highlight what actions to take. And sometimes if you're in the situation where you need to do both, you'll be able to do that. And this is really important because there is research that says that the likelihood of you meeting the person who is your financial twin, meaning they approach money, they think about money, they behave with it, they make the same choices as you do about it, are no, almost no. You are more likely to attract your financial opposite than you are to attract the person who does everything the same as you. So now we're gonna dive into the financial wheel. And so here what I need you to do is to take out a piece of paper if you haven't already, draw a circle as large as you possibly can, divide the inside of that circle so that you have a vertical line and a horizontal line. So you basically should have four sections or four quadrants when you're looking at this circle. On the upper left-hand quadrant, so say between 9 a.m. and 12 p.m., label that earn. On the upper right hand, say between 12 p.m. and 3 p.m., label that save. Between 3 p.m. and uh, 6 p.m., label that invest. And then in the box that remains between 6 p.m. and 9 p.m., label that spend. So if you're looking at your financial wheel and you're looking at it as if it were a watch and you're going clockwise, you've got earn on the upper left, save on the upper right, invest on the bottom right, spend on the bottom left. 
And what I want you to um, think about first is, where do you think you spend the most of your mental energy thinking about money? Is it regarding earn, save, invest, and spend? Just write that down on any, on, any, on any piece of the paper that you have some free space on. And then, if you're in a relationship, how do you think your mate would respond to that? Where does he or she spend most of their mental energy when it comes to thinking about money? So just hold that in your back pocket as we go through each of the sections and the questions within each of the sections. So we're gonna start with save. And what I'm gonna ask you to do is to spend, to suspend the reality of what you are currently able to save and think about if you didn't have any constraints, how much would you wanna save in the next 30 days? How much would you wanna save by the end of this year? And taking a step back from that, how much would you want to say you have saved over the course of your lifetime? And whatever numbers you write down for that, then indicate why. So how much do you want to save in the next 30 days? How much do you want to save this year? How much do you want to save over the course of your lifetime? And then why? And again, when putting down your numbers, give yourself permission to think big and think beyond um, what is currently possible or doable. Moving on to invest. Now, typically when we talk about investments, we're thinking about assets such as stocks, bonds, mutual funds, real estate, and all that's fine. Write that down. But what I also invite you to do is to write down who are the people in your life that you want to be able to support? What causes do you want to be able to support? And once you've written that down, also indicate why. Why is that important to you? So expand the scope of investing beyond the usual suspects of stocks, bonds, and mutual funds and real estate to also include the people in your life and the causes that you want to support. And of course, why? Now, I am sure that everyone under the sound of my voice at some point in time has said, if I had more money, I would. <laughs> so if you have in fact said that, um, like I presume you have, and money were not an issue, what would be different about your lifestyle? How would you spend your time? What would you buy? Where would you go? And as you're writing that down, I hope you are writing it down and not just uh, listening without writing because the exercise of writing is really helpful. As you're writing it down, also indicate what excites you about the possibility, if that were to really come true, what excites you about that? And then also, what scares you about it? And my silent moments are purposeful to give you a chance to actually write something down. And now we move back to earn. And here I want to imagine if you were to go into your boss's office tomorrow, or if you own a business, if you were to renegotiate your rates, what would that look like? What would the change look like in terms of renegotiating your compensation, whether it is your salary or your total compensation package, or whether it's you know how much you charge for your services and your bottom line revenue? If you were to go in tomorrow and renegotiate either with your boss or renegotiate your rates with your clients, what would change? And how would that impact your take-home pay for the next 30 days? How would that impact your income for this year? And then taking a step back again, how would your, or what would you want your income to be is a better question. What would you want your income to be over your lifetime? And once more, what's the why behind the numbers that you've indicated? Now, if you noticed, there was a difference between how we plotted, if you will, and drew the circle, the financial wheel. 
and how we went about asking the questions. And that was intentional. That wasn't an oversight. We started drawing it beginning with earn and then going to save, invest, and spend because that is really how we've been conditioned to approach money. We make decisions about how much we're going to save, how we're going to invest it, how much are we going to spend and, and on what based upon what we earn. I call that living by default. But by inviting you to begin to ask the questions or to answer the questions with the section of save and then ending up with earn, it's really an invitation to say, well, how can you live by design? Because then the question becomes, if I want to do these things, if this is how much I want to save and this is why, if these are the things that I want to invest in and this is why, if this is what I really want my lifestyle to be like and why, well then what do I need to earn to make that happen? It's a subtle shift, but it is a significant shift. And you more than likely are going to see a gap between where you are and where you want to be as per your financial wheel or what you wrote down. And really that gap is an opportunity to see where do you need to be more strategic? Where do you need to be more discerning? Where do you need to apply more creative thinking or perhaps even discipline? And here's where this really comes in helpful in terms of mastering the language of love and money. You go through the financial wheel exercise, you have your mate go through the financial wheel exercise, and then you come together and you share what your respective answers are to each of the different sub questions and each of the different quadrants. And you will be amazed at what you learn and discover about this person that you may have spent years with. I mean, I've had couples who have been together for a very, very long time discover things about their mate that they didn't know, again, going back to underlying beliefs and underlying behaviors. So this is one exercise that you can automatically do with whomever you're with right now. And if you're not in a relationship, when you feel more comfortable, this is something that you can do with that person. So when people say, I don't know what to ask, this is where you start. When people say, well, when do I ask? You ask at the point in time, whenever it is that you feel com comfortable sharing your answers. Because I always say, don't ask a question that you yourself are not prepared to answer. So in our time that we have left before we have to end, I want to go through very quickly eight, what I call eight no matter what habits that you can employ, if you will, to help close the gap on your financial will between where you are and where you want to be. And this goes back again, connecting this to mastery. I really believe that when it comes to financial intimacy, that it first has to begin with yourself. And when you do that, you create the space for it to happen with another person. That's one. Two, the whole term mastery really is a reflection of something that is ongoing. You don't just learn it and then stop. It's a skill that you constantly have to cultivate and money is a skill or be making good choices with money is a skill. And it's also all about behavior modification. And each of the habits that we're going to talk about represents either an area of difference that you have with your mate or something that you share in common. So let me just really quickly go through what you can take away from each of these different habits. When I say to people to track your money, I'm not suggesting it for the purposes of creating a budget as much as I am suggesting it for the purposes of understanding what is your pattern of behavior when it comes to money. When, when do you use your cash? When do you use your credit card? When do you use your debit card? Why do you use your cash or your debit card? What is the money that's coming in versus the money that's going out? Tracking your money not only gives you a sense of your income statement in terms of profit or loss on a personal level, but it also gives you some insight as to whether or not you're using your money in accordance to what you say you want to use your money for. So track your money. The second would be to have some rules or to have some policies around when will you use your cash? When will you, when will you use your credit card or your debit card? When will you go into debt? How much debt will you go into? I mean, these are some of the nuances that many couples don't even begin to approach in terms of talking about when they're dating or soon after marriage. And these are the kinds of conversations that they should be having. 
So track your money and have some rules around how you're going to use your money and see where you are. If you are on the same page with the other person, see where you are in terms of sharing those commonalities. And if you aren't, this gives you a clue as to how you can kind of bridge the gap between where you are and where you ideally want to be. Let your goals drive your money decisions. 99.9% .9 of every goal that you have has a financial component to it. And the finances to finance it are going to come from the money that you have right now. In addition to that, when you are in a couple, your personal goals don't go away. So in, instead, you've got three buckets, your goals, his or her goals, and then the goals of the relationship. And you've got to sometimes make some tough choices around where are you going to prioritize the funding. And if you let your goals drive your money decisions, if you let an agreement around what's going to be the priority drive your money decisions, you'll feel a lot better about your trade-offs and you'll be smarter about what those trade-offs look like. Outsource but don't abdicate. I am a huge component of hiring financial support and getting a financial team together. However, it is your money and so you can never abdicate the responsibility or the ultimate judgment about what to do or not to do to somebody else. So make sure that you outsource, get the professional support that you need, but don't close your eyes and set it and forget it. Review your financial wheel monthly. You might think that this is self-serving and it isn't. Um, how many times have you attended a financial workshop or any workshop and you took copious notes and then those notes just stayed in a, in a notebook and you never went back to look at it? Don't let that happen here. You have the financial wheel exercise as an opportunity to give you a sense of, again, where you are and where you want to be, to see that out on paper, to see what the numbers look like in terms of not only what they are, but what you want them to be. And this is a great way of being able to benchmark your progress and monitor your progress. And all you have to do is take maybe 15 minutes the first Sunday of each month, look at your financial wheel, let this be a part of your financial date, if you will, with your mate. And this is one of the ways also that you can have it become more fun and not just something that is burdensome. And we're winding it down here. Um, the next tip here or the next habit is to acknowledge peer pressure. We may not still be in high school, we may not still be in college, but we can't deny the fact that the people that we spend the most time with certainly influence um, the things that we want and the experiences that we want to have. And again, that goes back to all of those things require money. And so we need to acknowledge that we do have peer pressure when it comes to that. The next habit is to get organized. Typically, when we think of organization, we think of it in terms of paper and physical space clutter. I'm not just talking about that, even though that does matter. I also think that we need to be mindful of emotional clutter. We need to be mindful, and by emotional clutter, I mean what are our thoughts and what are our beliefs about money. We need to be mindful of calendar clutter. Are we overbooking ourselves so much that that's the reason why we don't take the time to sit down and do the financial wheel? Is that the reason why we don't take the time to actually open our mail and see what's going on? Um, get organized and remember that it's not just about paper and clutter, but you're also looking at mental clutter and financial clutter. And then the final habit here is to practice discipline. You know, I said at the beginning that money is about behavior modification. Some of you may need to do all eight of the habits that I outlined. Others of you might only need to do one, two, three, four, five, six, maybe seven. Um, but whatever the number of habits it is that you need to do, recognize that your number is going to be different than another person listening in on today's session. And that is perfectly fine because that's one of the reasons why it's called personal finance. It's personal. And so these are really intended to help you figure out what do you need to do? What, what do you need to strengthen? Um, what do you need to do to get closer to the fulfillment of your goals? And 
how can you use these as a way of bridging whatever emotional or financial gap might exist between you and your beloved? So I know that we're right at the uh, 30 minute mark here. So let's open it up before I give my final closing remarks for Q&A. And I just want to remind everyone that if you have a question, you can still submit it now in the chat or to info at SavvyLadies.org. Um, and I just wanted to ask you, do you think that people get defeated about the earn part of the circle? Have you seen that? I do. Um, so yes, I have seen that. And I do think that they get defeated about it. And then I think, though, that that is really an opportunity to explore and inquire, well, what's the cause of that defeat? Is it because you work in an industry that has a, is, is known for um, having lower salaries than what you actually need to live the life that you want? Or is it because you haven't advanced to the extent that you wanted to? So it's defeating only because it's different <laughs> than what you want it to be. Um, and you can't see clearly the path to, to change that. And so what I always say to folks is to just spend some time researching and exploring if, if the number that you are experiencing right now is not the number that you ultimately want, then what are some of the different choices, even though they may be hard, what are some of the different choices that you need to make to bring that closer to where you want it to be? Okay. Um, a question that came in is, we have a re reoccurring argument about how much money we need in our emergency fund. I want more and he's a spender. Do you have any suggestions? Yes. Um, so I would say that two things. If what's in the emergency fund is enough to cover at least six months, maybe even nine months of your living ex expenses, um, then let that be your at your minimum in terms of your benchmark. If you're not there yet, then this becomes a really great negotiating tool. And maybe what you can say to your mate is, look, I know you want to spend X or you, you know, you typically spend X. Let's have the first goal be to get our emergency account to Y. And then once we do that, I will get off of, you know, talking to you about how much you are spending but your spending is preventing us from hitting this goal. And I would feel much more secure if we hit this goal. Okay. And we have time for one last question, which is my husband and I grew up very differently. And I think our upbringings shaped the way we deal with money and explain why we value it differently. Mm -hmm. So do you have any tips for what we can do going forward to really connect more? I would highly recommend uh, that they go through the financial wheel exercise and then add a layer to that, which is, you know, what in your family background has led to the answers that you provided? Because our families influence our values, our beliefs, our expectations, they influence our habits. We're either doing things because of what we saw growing up or we're doing things because we want to do the opposite of what we saw growing up. So this is really an opportunity to delve a little bit more deeply into the why behind why she and her husband do the things that they do. And then to really come to an agreement about, well, what's the reality that they want to create for their marriage, for their family? Um, because sometimes the friction is that you go into a relationship and you just automatically assume that what you saw growing up is going to be your experience, not recognizing that your mate's experience more than likely was very different than yours as this person is indicating. And you haven't yet figured out how do you use the best of both of those situations to create your own new reality. Okay, great. Well, thank you again, Jaquette, for your presentation. Thank you to everyone who joined us today, and we look forward to you being with us again for future webinars, and you can check out SavvyLadies.org. And thank you again so much, Jacquette, for your time today. 
Thank you.